Thank you for joining us today and welcome to today's discussion of the actively dying patient. This is the second discussion in our series. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you to you the chair of the End of Life Symposium, an incredibly talented physician, leader, poet, and friend, Dr. Chandana Banerjee. Thank you, Crystal, for that lovely introduction and welcome everybody to the City of Hope End of Life Symposium webinar series. Today is the second webinar in this nine series webinar. The webinar, for those of you that are returning from the last month, from the last presentation, is divided into three domains. The first one being humanities, the second one being clinical aspects of end of life, and the third one being medical aid and dying and other options at the end of life. Today's lecture will be focused on the second domain, which is the clinical aspects at the end of life. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Susan Elizabeth Wong. Susan, is, Susan Elizabeth Wong is the medical director for Kaiser Permanente National Quality Initiative in shared decision making and life care planning for KP Southern California. She is also the chief of the Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at Kaiser Permanente West Los Angeles, where she started inpatient and outpatient palliative consult services up to hospitals. She is the Director Emeritus of the Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles Hospice and Palliative Medicine Fellowship, a program she created in 2008. She is an assistant clinical professor at UCLA and triple board certified in internal geriatric and palliative medicine. Dr. Wong represents KP on the National Academy of Sciences Roundtable on quality care in serious illness. She served on the National Quality Forum to establish standards for certification of decision aids. She is also co-investigator on the PCORI technology-enabled home-based palliative care study. On a personal note, Dr. Wong was my program director when I trained in the Hospice and Palliative Medicine Fellowship at Kaiser Permanente in Southern California, and I'm forever in debt to her for that. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Susan Wong. Oh, thank you for that warm introduction, Dr. Banerjee. It's my, it's my pleasure to be here today with all of you. So uh, one uh, piece I'd like to point out from the beginning is that we, as you see this uh, webinar is titled The Actively Dying Patient, and then I do switch it over to the actively dying person. And that's really just a, a reminder to, uh, to each of us that uh, when we talk about patients, patients are people too. And of course, we will be, um, we will be using those terms interchangeably throughout the, the time that we have here today. So let's move on. And we'll go ahead and uh, provide for you that there are no financial disclosures today. Uh, I may on occasion indulge in a, in a caffeine habit, um, but otherwise nothing to share with you. So, uh, so active, um, by definition, the actively dying phase occurs within three days of, of death. However, most of the available data that I present will be provided in median times for patients with cancer because that's where the literature involves. Not every patient will have the same symptoms at the same time in the same order, of course. And here is an overview of changes that may occur months or weeks before end of life for you to see. We will next spend some time on specific signs leading up to the actively dying stage. So one week uh, prior to death, the following is likely to occur in your person. There may be peripheral edema. It may be from poor circulation and or lack of mobility and can be found in the legs, arms, and coccyx areas, the dependent parts of the body. The main treatment is repositioning, although one may consider diuretics if oral intake is intact, and polyuria, polyuria is an acceptable trade-off for the patient. Delirium is a common symptom at end of life. This may result 
um, as a result of hypoxia and, uh, and relative um, poor circulation uh, for the brain as the brain as that becomes less sufficient or as a direct result of tumor or infection related to the primary terminal illness. It can be diagnosed by the confusion assessment method or the CAM, C-A-M. Classic behaviors include inattention, fluctuating course, uh, disorganized thinking, and altered level of consciousness, which could represent hypoactive delirium and look like lethargy or hyperactive delirium and look like restlessness or vigilance. The person may have mood swings or hallucinations. And treatment includes addressing potential contributors such as anticholinergic or antipsychotic medications, constipation, pain or other symptoms, or sensory impairment such as hearing or visual trouble. It helps to avoid arguing, to speak clearly and explain the reason for doing caregiver activities such as it's time for your pain pill so that you won't start to hurt. Another sign of active dying is dysphagia for solid foods, which can look like spitting, pocketing food, coughing, or choking. The treatment is to change the food consistency to softer, pureed, and or smaller bites. Decreased speech is a universal and normal change in the dying person. As such, there's no treatment per se, and although you hear me repeat treatment throughout this talk, Keep in mind that the key consideration is normalization of the dying process and education of the patient, the family, and the caregivers. All potential treatments are meant to be comfort focused only. Another common sign is mottled skin. It usually starts in the periphery as a purple lacy pattern due to poor circulation and can spread upward. When the skin feels cool, you can apply a light blanket for comfort. Now, let's look at four to six days before death. You will start to see abnormal vital signs like tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, and or hypothermia. Be sure to stop any offending medication that could be worsening these signs. Next, there is decreased level of consciousness, including increased sleeping hours and decreased ar arousal for the patient. And then you'll see dysphagia for liquids. The management is to shift to oral hygiene rather than oral intake by keeping the mouth moist and clean. Within two to three days of death begins the active dying phase. This is the palliative performance scale. Uh, the active dying phase is typically accounted for by a PPS of 20% or less. You can see on the, on the scale here that this includes that the patient is bed bound, dependent for activities of daily living or care, and has minimal oral intake. And a decrease in visibility of the nasolabial fold is seen. In one study, these two signs combined inferred a 94% mortality risk within the next three days. So PPS of 20% or less and drooping of the nasolabial fold. Hyperextension of the neck can be seen and is managed by repositioning or opioids if uncomfortable for the patient. Next, you will see alternating periods of apnea, alternating with rapid shallow breathing. So you can see on the screen, there's uh, almost a, a, a shallow panting that occurs and then a long pause. And while this can be distressing for patients, uh, families or caregivers, um, usually this is, um, this is a common change to see. Um, and so being able to demonstrate this pattern to your, to your patient as a normal part of the active dying process can be really helpful to provide reassurance to the family unit. If the patient appears breathless, of course, you can use opioids to support that symptom. The pupils can become non-reactive with light and you will see decreased responsiveness to verbal or visual cues where the person may appear to be in a coma state, look withdrawn or have glassy eyes. Within two days before death, this is when the patient may demonstrate a death rattle. This is a sound of breathing through oral secretions. 
the average time from onset of the rattle until death is 16 hours. Keep in mind the prevalence of the symptom is 60%, so it's not universal for every dying patient still. And although the sound may be frightening to an observer, this is unlikely adding to the patient's suffering. It can be managed with repositioning, anticholinergics, and light evacuation of excess saliva using an oral swab or a washcloth. You can do oral suction. We do recommend against bronchial or deep suction. Note that of all the anticholinergics, I did highlight glycopyrrolate here due to its mechanism of not crossing the blood-brain barrier. That limits adverse side effects that can be seen with anticholinergics like delirium or urine retention. So that may be a better choice if medication is chosen. Then the chain stokes respiration pattern can evolve into apnea with deep sighs or prolonged pauses between breaths. Again, opioids can be used if this seems uncomfortable for the patient. The next sign is that the jaw drops with inspiration. And then urine output decreases, typically to under 200 ml per day. The urine may also appear dark and bowel movements may decrease as well. You may be unable to palpate the radial pulse and even capturing uh, a blood pressure on the person may become more difficult. The patient's eyelids could stay open. You can focus on replacing moisture if the eyes appear dry or irritated, but this is a normal change. And the person may make grunting noises from active expiration through the vocal cords and appear to be grimacing or twitching. Finally, fever is a common uh, symptom in the actively dying person and can be managed with cooling measures uh, or acetaminophen. It's typically, for, from the actively dying stage, fever is usually defined as a temperature above 100 degrees. So not surprising, if you are asked to make a clinical prediction of death, there is a direct relationship between the number of clinical signs of dying and the incidence of death. So knowing these changes can help you predict uh, what may happen for the person and help provide that anticipatory guidance to the family and the caregivers. In addition to the physical signs of active dying, we are likely to see manifestations of grief in our patients and their loved ones. These are the six stages of grief, denial, and, some, and, and the way to account for this would be the person thinking, this cannot be happening to me. Anger, why is this happening to me? Bargaining, if I just do better, then this will all go away. Depression, this is devastating and I am hopeless. Into acceptance, I don't like it, but I will do my best. And hopefully into meaning, how do I best honor this life or my life? And, the, and some responses are how you can help uh, your person go through the stages of grief and hopefully find meaning at this time in their life is to provide affirmation and allow the patient to work through unresolved business. You can consider dignity therapy. There's some evidence for that can be helpful. And if you are a family member, Ira Bayak wrote a great book called uh, The Four Things That Matter Most, and it can help relationships heal through grief. These include sayings such as, please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you. Now, how do we diagnose death? Just like we do an assessment in basic life support or BLS protocols, check the airway, breathing, and circulation over a period of a few minutes. If you remember in the active dying phase, we see chain stokes and outright apnea in the patient. So you wanna be sure that you're doing repeat assessments over a matter of minutes. So you are um, being sure you're not capturing the patient during one of those uh, apneic episodes. An interesting fact in Los Angeles County, it is not required that medical personnel make a death pronouncement if the patient's in the home. It can be done by the caregiver or the family. So these are the key elements for knowing if, you're, if your person or your patient has expired. What diagnoses lead to death in the United States? 
This is CDC data, and you can see heart disease and cancer remain the number one and number two leading causes. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has become the third leading cause of death uh, for 2020, uh, with over 200,000 lives lost as of today. So let's review disease-specific signs of active dying. In congestive heart failure, patients often have dyspnea, edema, cough, wheezing, delirium, tachycardia, hypotension, and a phenomenon called cardiac cachexia, which is manifested by anorexia and muscle atrophy. Early management can include optimizing the cardiac medication regimen, uh, and then we, de we recommend deprescribing as death advances. Remember, a person with CHF may have hypotension as, a, as a, uh, a sign of the dying process. So we would want to be sure to remove those blood pressure medications if they're aggravating that symptom so that we are not hastening, or harming, hastening death or harming the patient. People with cancer can show fatigue, anorexia or anhedonia, and you may see organ specific signs. So depending on the primary cancer or the metastatic locations, you may see complications related to the, the mechanical or physical effect of that malignancy. Management uh, in particular for uh, cancer related fatigue can include exercise, energy conservation, addressing anemia, depression, pain or other symptoms, massage and acupuncture. There are other uh, medications or um, complementary uh, agents that are under investigation currently. Um, meds that have been found to show some efficacy do include erythropoietin, antidepressants, psychostimulants, and steroids. In COPD, patients may have somnolence, dyspnea, anxiety, depression, or delirium. Treating hypoxia with a target oxygen saturation of 88 to 92% can help prevent hypoventilation and hypercapnia due to poor ventilation perfusion mismatch. This also avoids the Haldane effect where supplemental oxygen decreases the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin. Both mechanisms reduce carbon dioxide elimination and can contribute to the somnolence and poor respiration and breathlessness for the patient. Aside from uh, O2, other therapies include bronchodilators and steroids. For dementia, this is a, a disease that um, starts out usually as a chronic illness and can progress to um, a dying stage. In patients over a period of time, will show limited speech, dysphagia, decreased mobility, incontinence, delirium, sleep-wake reversal, and perhaps nonverbal behaviors. Although there are many medications that are common to use for dementia syndromes, supportive care is really the gold standard approach. People with renal failure will have symptoms of uremia, which can include uremic pruritus, edema, and oliguria. When a patient is on chronic hemodialysis and they stop that intervention, the median survival is eight days and will depend on the urine output of the patient. Now that we know the signs of the actively dying patient and we've considered more specifically what you might see depending on the terminal diagnosis of the person, let's consider what elements constitute a high quality end of life experience for our, our, our people. Surveys indicate that, that our patients want to expire during their sleep and achieve physical and remote and emotional relief most of all. Some interesting findings here include discrepancies between patient and family priorities. You can see that the religious or spiritual elements are more important to patients than families, while dignity, quality of life, and life completion are more important for families than patients. And I think, again, that just points out that while the patient themselves is going through grief, of course, the people surrounding the, the dying person are also going through grief. And each of us will have our own uh, values related to what we hope to achieve or heal through this process. 
Pivoting to the care team, an optimal care team will demonstrate clinical competence, ability to meet patients and families where they are at in the process, and provide empathic reassurance about the normal changes uh, related to the, to the dying phases. Now, there's not a lot of robust literature to differentiate active dying across race, gender, religion, language, sexual orientation, or gender identity. We do know that clinicians may carry unconscious biases around the death experience, though. So it is imperative to address our own internal maps and develop an inquisitive nature around each person that we are called to serve. Uh, you may be familiar with this, uh, but there, were, there have been studies to show, for example, that half of white medical trainees hold false beliefs about black people or patients. And we know that the uh, black patient population is less likely than white patients to receive pain medication. So it's just a call for each of us to examine um, our, uh, what we know and, um, and to approach our patients individually and personally uh, so we can attend to their needs appropriately. One chief concern for many clinicians and families is regarding nutrition and hydration. To help navigate the dying process, it may be good to know that survival in a healthy person without food alone is around two months and without water can range from eight to 21 days. These clinical changes regarding body temperature, blood pressure dysregulation, electrolyte abnormalities, brain edema and joint stiffness uh, can be seen in both healthy people undergoing starvation and the actively dying person. The difference is that the dying body undergoes anorexia and dysphagia as part of the normal process and adding more food or water than the person can take in by mouth does not guarantee increased survival or improved quality of life. In practice, I often use an analogy with my families around how overwatering a plant can actually accelerate its demise rather than keeping it healthy. Hydration can have benefit if given before the active dying stage, such as it can increase survival by hours or days, decrease delirium or reduce fatigue, there are also burdens to consider, like pain from the infusion, chest congestion, and edema. The best evidence is to hydrate only if there's clear distress secondary to dehydration, nausea, emesis, diarrhea, or opioid toxicity. Uh, recommended protocols, if you choose to manage uh, this with hydration, is, uh, includes a subcutaneous infusion of 50 mLs continuous or 80 ml uh, overnight for 12 hours, or you can do a bolus of 500 ml over one hour twice a day. Uh, Dr. Brera has written a lot on this issue and you can see some of these citations here. Regardless of the decisions around hydration, arguably the primary symptom to attend to is thirst with good oral and dental care and saliva stimulating or replacing products. Um, there have been some creative uh, studies to try to examine this, such as using an NG tube and assessing if thirst is present or not present. And it's hard to really provide solid evidence around the patient experience in the last hours or days, but it's not thought that people have hunger or thirst deeply during the dying phase. We really just want to attend to the best oral care uh, from the standpoint of dignity uh, for the patient. Other questions that arise during active dying include, is my loved one in pain? Note that pain does not automatically increase as death approaches. In order to provide adequate relief at this stage, assess for nonverbal signs of pain and limit unnecessary medications or interventions. What about, can my loved one hear me? Uh, to respond, you would want to know the patient's baseline hearing function. Clinical experience indicates an expectation that patients can hear you as they go through the dying phase. So we have you, um, recommendations include to talk gently and explain all the caregiving roles like we talked about earlier. Um, we, it can be very startling to somebody with, um, with uh, a pain or other symptom or with a sensory impairment 
to enter the room and um, begin to change a diaper or give a medication without talking through each step of the process. You would want to introduce new people uh, such as um, a nurse or a doctor that may enter the room or a shift in caregiving and to consider um, playing uh, sounds that attend to the priorities of the patient. And so improving quality of life is very personal, but that could mean playing music, uh, scripture, news, drama, uh, or even having silence for that patient. So this is an overview of all um, of the components of the actively dying person, including the physical signs um, with attention to um, the grief stages that the, the person can go to. And although we did cover some management options, I think it's uh, important to consider that really the, the role um, of each of us as healthcare providers is to address avoidable distress and suffering for not only the patient, but the family and caregivers. And that includes that empathic reassurance about which, which pieces of the dying uh, changes are, are normal and help to um, reduce stress and suffering at end of life for all our patients. Thank you so much for your time today and commitment to learning. Thank you, Susan. Thanks. Well, at this point, um, stop taking questions from the audience. Is there any for Dr. Lang? If you don't see the questions pop up, then um, you can ask Dr. Wong to comment a little bit more on the presentation. Um, so one of the questions we want to know is, how should clinicians prepare both themselves and families to cope with the actively dying phase? Right, so um, let me make sure I'm hearing the question. So how would clinicians um, approach the normalization of all the changes of active dying? And how can we also prepare families? And prepare our families, wonderful. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. You know, I think, um, I think a lot of it, I, I always challenge each of us as clinicians to, um, to first actually to get to know ourselves a little bit um, and, and understand our own uh, potential biases around the death experience. And even uh, it may even include, um, as part of our effort to become a better clinician, it could include videotaping ourselves, having a mock conversation with the patient or family um, around uh, the changes of active dying. And so, so I think it allows us to um, pay attention to the words that we use or the nonverbal type of communication that we demonstrate with, with patients and families. So we know, for instance, that um, even nonverbal um, or physical things that we do in the in uh, next to the patient or next to the family can be can be interpreted in different ways. So uh, so so I think some of the key strategies would be to um, to be calm and ourselves to talk through um, what's happening. So I'll give you an example. If I walk into a home and I see somebody who to me, it looks like they're in an active dying phase. And maybe the family doesn't quite recognize that time could be very short, minutes or hours even. So that would be a common scenario for, for many of us working, uh, working in this space with, uh, with very sick patients. So, um, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't myself become anxious or concerned with getting them on board right away. You know, I would, I would reflect on the situation. I would try to attend with the family. Maybe they're concerned about a death rattle that they're seeing. And I would say, okay, you know, show me what you're seeing. And we, we go to the person, we're respectful to the person. I always, even if the person's actively dying and maybe they're not able to verbalize or communicate with me directly, I still address them directly by their name. Do they like to be called uh, Mrs. Rodriguez or go by Gina? How, how should I approach your mother here? And so I attend to the patient and then I'm able to, um, hear the concerns of the family and help to normalize. So that's always the first thing is to say, okay, so, so you're worried about these sounds that are coming out of the mouth. The first thing is just to tell you, I, I see this all the time. And in fact, this is a normal part of the stage that your mother's going through right now. So it's normal and it's okay. 
And that's the first thing that I do. Because I think it helps take the temperature down a notch if there's a lot of emotions and, and fear associated with the dying process. Right. Um, and so, and, and, and then I think in, in terms of um, the language that we use uh, ourselves, just challenging ourselves to, um, to not be, um, I think if you're new to the work, sometimes we get scared. And so being able to say, well, maybe I'm seeing uh, a wound that looks bad or something that um, maybe it doesn't look good to me, but I never overreact. You know, I might say, okay, well, that looks like what I would expect for a wound at this stage, or this is what I might expect for someone with this disease process. Um, I try not to say things like, oh, that looks bad, or you're right, or I'm worried about, you know, how they look right now. So I think, again, when I communicate that, that's a signal to that family to be worried as well. Um, so I'm always trying to match where they are and take it down a notch um, to help them understand that it's normal. And then I think, and then subsequently, of course, if there are things that you want to do as an intervention, like, hey, let's reposition mom and, and see if that, um, that uh, rattling sound goes away um, or offer other treatments at that point. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Um, another question that we got asked is, can you talk about the multidisciplinary team, including social workers, chaplains, and other people, and how you work as a team with patients and families. Absolutely. So, so the, the interdisciplinary team is so critical to the care of the actively dying, dying person. And I talked about some of the key elements um, that Dr. Farrell and her team from, from City of Hope have published around the optimal care team uh, for, for our dying patients. Uh, and so, you know, I think um, in terms of the physical signs, um, often that's seen as a, a domain for the nurse and the doctor to recognize those physical signs. But of course, um, because of the interdisciplinary nature of palliative medicine and, uh, and, and serious illness care, um, any team member, if, if I have uh, a social worker that I'm uh, working with on a team to take care of a dying patient and she or he notices that the patient has a death rattle and they notice that the family is distressed, you know, they would contact uh, the nurse or myself and clue me into that so we can attend to that from a, from a medical treatment or uh, addressing that standpoint. Um, but as you, as you hopefully have been able to see, it's not just the recognizing the physical and the normal changes of active dying, it's attending to those grief uh, behaviors as well. And so, you know, sometimes uh, we talk about, for instance, maybe um, the patient has um, issues related to grief that require closure from different family members. And so that would be a critical place for a social worker, for a chaplain, uh, for psychologists, for other team members to come in and talk and really help that patient um, attend to um, all, all of the, the key pieces to help them understand um, how to hopefully achieve closure with that difficult relationship. Um, and also for the family members surrounding that patient, maybe the, maybe the person has lost their ability to verbalize um, and there could be guilt or regret that's lingering. Uh, but, it, but we do think the patient can still hear, you know, so maybe that's an opportunity for a family member to be able to continue to um, go through those stages of grief um, in a way that, that offers healing uh, for the whole family unit. So each team member is absolutely uh, critical uh, to attend to the needs of the, of the dying person. So what's the approach to using medications to address terminal restlessness or agitation versus exploring other reasons for the symptoms such as emotional distress? Yeah. And what if there is disagreement between the patient and the family on using medications for these symptoms? So great questions. Uh, and, and so, and, and to disclose, you know, as much as I can, I want to be evidence-based in the, in the presentation. I think when it comes to delirium, a lot of uh, interventions can be more practice or clinically based. Um, so I'd like to call out, there are some black box warnings, for instance, to use the use of antipsychotics for delirium. Um, however, you know, as with anything in medicine, it's really about trade-offs of what you're hoping to achieve as a positive effect and accepting consequences. Um, and this isn't a person who, for whom um, 
they are transitioning or in the active dying phase. And so, so really, you know, the priority at this stage is to offer the best comfort focused treatment. And that's how I would always approach those symptoms of restlessness uh, in the patient. Um, so, so, you know, we would always start with the, um, with the lower risk options first, and that is removing potentially offending medications. Um, so if a patient had um, previously had urinary incontinence and they're on uh, a medication uh, that's an anticholinergic for incontinence, we would get rid of that because that could potentially um, aggravate delirium for the patient. And we know that incontinence, as we've learned today, is already a normal sign of, of dying. And so that's not going to be the priority of trying to medicate that uh, for, for the individual. So we want to remove offending agents as best we can. And as we go through that process of uh, probable de-prescribing, uh, we do recognize that many symptom medications can have side effects of delirium. So it could involve, uh, for instance, if there's pain management practice, maybe it requires an opioid rotation. So for patients who take um, morphine, um, about a third of them may have adverse reactions, which could include delirium as a, as a side effect. And so, for instance, a person who might be well controlled on morphine, it may be beneficial if they're having delirium to rotate to a different opioid um, to see if that would be better tolerated. So those are some strategies as you, as you examine um, potential contributors to delirium and try to, try to remove them um, to, to improve the care of the patient. I think um, when it comes to using um, medications for delirium, if they're really, if you really think they're within, you know, two to three days um, of, uh, you know, within the active dying phase, there are medications, again, that are commonly used, such as an antipsychotic or a benzodiazepine. Um, and I think that, you know, there, there's some evidence um, clinically that that could be beneficial for the patient um, to help, um, relieve distress from restlessness. And it might look like, um, you know, perhaps they are removing sheets uh, off the bed or tearing at their clothing. It could look like distress. And so being able to, um, to help uh, provide some calm and relief for the patient, those medications can help. I would say I have a low threshold uh, for um, seeing those behaviors as, as representing pain. So if, re, if you have any reason to think that the patient is in pain or physical distress, you know, we would advocate um, treating that uh, because the, the survival is so short, we, we would just really wanna ensure that, um, uh, that, that we can um, target a comfort focused experience for that person. Well, Dr. Wong, are clinicians um, in your knowledge being taught to discuss and explain voluntary stopping of eating and drinking as an option at the end of life? Yeah, so great question. Um, yeah, so the phenomenon of voluntary cessation of eating and drinking um, implies if it's voluntary that the patient has capacity to make uh, an election to say, you know what, I've been given a terminal uh, prognosis and I'm going to choose not to eat or drink anymore to, um, to hasten my death because that is, um, that is what's important to me. You know, I don't want to linger um, through the dying experience. And so um, that's, uh, th that uh, election uh, and that choice is certainly uh, legal and ethical for patients to make. And so um, as they embark, for a person that embarks on that pathway, you know, I think we as clinicians would just, again, want to attend to any kind of side effect or manifestation of not eating and drinking. So mostly the oral hygiene, ensuring the mouth is moist um, or that they're not uncomfortable as a side effect from those decisions. Um, that to me, so, so the, the, the voluntary cessation of eating and drinking might be a little bit different than what you see with people, again, as, as we saw here, universally, everybody stops eating and drinking due to first, a loss of appetite, and second, a loss of uh, swallowing ability, so dysphagia for solids and then liquids. And so those two features are a common universal change that we see in the active dying patient. So it wouldn't at that point be voluntarily voluntary decision. It's really just um, a normal uh, process. So as clinicians, whether it's a voluntary choice or we're seeing that as a normal change of, of the dying person, 
Uh, we want to attend to it from a comfort point of view like we do for everything else. Did, did that answer your question, Dr. Banerjee? It, it definitely seems to clear. Thank you. Um, you know, some of the questions uh, we'd like to answer is also, would this be very similar for a child that is in the active design phase? How does it differ if, if at all? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And most of the literature does look at adults. And as, as I said from the beginning, even adults with malignancies. So, um, so as you can see from dementia, when we talk about the signs of active dying, really a lot of those changes begin earlier. So decreased mobility, speech, appetite might happen even two years in advance before the active dying phase. So really what you're looking at are quantifiable changes over time. Maybe they had three meals a day and then two meals and then one meal, and then it, it switches to just a few spoonfuls here and there. So, so you're really looking at, um, you know, in, in the dementia course, that's um, looking at it over a broader period of time. So when it comes to pediatrics, um, there are not, not every one of those signs is, um, is so apparent. Now it depends on the age of the, the child, um, but certainly um, delirium is a little bit less common in, in the pediatric population than you would see in an older adult. Um, so that's one key difference. And the functional changes might have a different trajectory for children. So certainly an infant that's already dependent on certain functions will be quite different than, um, than a teenager, but, but children may retain quite a bit of um, mobility in certain functions um, until, until much later stages. Um, in fact, you'll see that um, even in younger adults, um, some of those changes. But, but with regard to globally, a decrease in appetite dysphagia, um, increase in, in somnolence, lethargy, and that withdrawal phenomenon might be more apparent. Um, and part of that's, an, it, it may be in, in effect how we relate socially to, to children than we do with adults as well. So, um, you know, the, in a pediatric um, population, as they go through the dying process, a lot of it is because it's such a um, aberrancy, I think, in our, in our culture to, to see a child die. Um, a lot of the work is really through that, that grief um, component of why, why me, why you, why us. Um, and so, so when, um, so, so especially in your older, um, in your older cohort, your preteens and teens, a lot of the, the key work is in, in going through um, and attending to some of the life closure components and also recognizing that withdrawal socially may, may be a normal feature for that. Um, for that patient as they are um, trying to come to terms and, and uh, with, with what they have to experience. Yes, there are some differences. Great. Um, another question that comes up often, and I see that also in my clinical practice, is when you um, enter the surroundings of an active design person, families are usually hesitant to talk to the patient. They actually almost are mourning and are quiet. Um, what are some of the recommendations you have for families to make this period a little bit more easeful, easing for the patient? Um, I know the patient can, as we know in literature, the patient can hear um, almost up until the end of life. Um, and I've also often recommended music and, and songs. Um, so what are some of the other recommendations or some of your recommendations that you give families? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I think the key step is that for each of us, when we are with the patient, to model that kind of behavior. And again, that means talking to the person as if they could talk back to me, even if they can't. So, you know, I try to get an eye level with the patient and communicate with them directly. And of course, I'm, I'll go back and forth um, because they, they may be at a stage where they can't uh, verbalize uh, in return. Uh, but I think that modeling sets a stage to support our families to understand that it's okay. And it's okay, this, this is a normal um, process for each of us and, and being able to talk to them and attend to them can be, can be really helpful. And in, in terms of yeah, playing music, I think that that's a great recommendation. I, I always like to really start out with who is this person in the room? You know, do they even like music? Maybe they hate music. Are they into soap operas or they want to watch the debate, you know, around the clock? I, I don't know, right? And so, so being able to attend to that individual around what they like, I think is really important. 
Um, and so, so when we think of sounds and communication, it's kind of, um, it, the recommendation is rooted in the values and priorities of the patient themselves. So, um, so I know my kids would, would, would love to, to hear music and I'm probably somebody who would prefer silence. And so each of us has a, has a preference when it comes to that, that sensory experience of sound. And I think being able to, um, to learn uh, what, those, um, what those priorities are and make recommendations aligned with that is, is really key. Um, the other comment I would have is around um, sometimes we surround a patient, you know, as they're going through the dying phase. Uh, and I think providing opportunity or recommending, depending on the dynamics of the family and the caregiver, um, having opportunities for individuals to have one on one time with that patient. Um, and, th and that reflects also that a family member, maybe they're not comfortable saying things to the dying person in front of a sibling or in front of a spouse. And so I think, you know, ensuring that for, for the sake of achieving some closure uh, through this process, that there is some uh, individual time for each family member. Great, wonderful. There is a question on the role of hospice of, um, at the end of life. And um, people would like to know how you broach bringing up hospice to families uh, for patients who appear like they are approaching or are in the actively dying phase. Right. Another great question. I, you know, it may depend a little bit on the location of the patient, although hospice can, can serve patients in any settings. Uh, but what I like to do is explain the benefits of hospice first, and the benefits are tremendous, as, as many of you uh, will already know. And so what I would do is talk to the family and say, you know, these, these things that you're seeing, um, I recognize these as signs that your loved one is um, approaching end of life, you know, and I check and kind of check that understanding. Is that a surprise to them? Are you surprised to hear me say this? Where are you at? And so I do some um, first steps of closing the gap and understanding that the, the patient is, um, is dying or, or, near end of, or near the death stage. And then I talk to them about, you know, I wonder if, um, wouldn't it be great if we could surround you with a team that could attend to these physical signs, could support you and your family with any questions about what you're seeing, um, help you answer questions about um, what to expect um, through this process and even um, into and after um, death occurs. And so I talk a little bit about what um, what I know hospice could offer to the patient and maybe even address some of the pain points uh, that I that I know that the, the family member already has. Um, so, so if they're not sure about caregiving, how do I change a diaper or turn my loved one or do these different pieces, it allows me to um, say, you know what, um, what if we could have a team and a nurse specifically um, with expertise in this um, dying process come and support you and educate you around how to do that. Wouldn't that be great? And so I essentially get them on board first with what the components of hospice are. And then I let them know, you know what, you know how we talked about that team? That's really what we call hospice. You know, have you heard of that? Um, what does that mean to you? Have you ever used hospice before? And so then that allows you to, I think, um, dispel any preconceived notions that could be negative from the patient. And maybe they'll say, oh, I did have, maybe I had a great experience with hospice or maybe I had a bad one. But now that you've laid the foundation that hospice can be really beneficial, it allows you to pivot and then address that, um, that individual barrier that the patient may hold. So you can say, oh, well, tell me about that bad experience. Um, this will be different um, because um, because this is what we're we're doing with your loved one today. Great, thank you for that um, that answer. Um, another another question or another concept that is really difficult not only for clinicians but also families is the use of opioids at the end of um, life or in the actively dying phase, where families might think that increasing pain medications might be the reason their loved ones are dying. You know, sure. So how can you talk a little bit about that last dose here in the space? Right. So, so that's a great question. And what I would, um, how I would respond 
is that um, because, um, and, and you could kind of take all these stages of, of dying and even use that um, directly to educate your patient. So, um, so now we know the time frames, you know, one week, uh, four days, two days, uh, hours. And so what we know is that the use of opioids um, at end of life, they don't, um, in, they don't um, decrease survival. Um, and that's been shown in other studies. Again, you know, I think opioids, um, of, so first of all, I wouldn't be surprised for a patient and family to have that bias because I think many clinicians have that bias. And that's because we do have an opioid crisis in this country um, and there can be misuse of opioids. So I think just for each of us who operate in the space of um, supporting patients with serious illness, just to accept that that's a fact. Um, and opioids used um, indiscriminately or inappropriate doses early on in the course in the pre-dying phase could have potential consequences, right? There could be toxicities. Um, you could have a person who's opioid naive and we give them 100 milligrams of morphine all at once, you know, that's likely to have a, 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 an adverse outcome for them. And so, so I think being able to, to, to recognize where people are coming from is a, is a key step. Um, we are all, um, as clinicians who care for patients like this, very comfortable with using opioids at this stage. But I think it always helps to kind of put ourselves in their shoes and understand that, that what they're saying is rooted in what they might be hearing in the media or with other types of non-dying patients that they may have worked with. So that's always the first part. And then I think, um, again, there's lots of evidence, mostly in small studies, um, to show that the use of opioids um, during the dying uh, phase does not increase survival. And in fact, there's some studies that show um, does not decrease survival. And some studies do show that the use of opioids may actually increase survival when used in the dying phase and when dosed appropriately. Um, and so that's a message I think is very reasonable to, um, to educate a family about um, that once we're able to um, uh, help the patient with more efficient breathing patterns, for instance, to move them from a chain stokes respiration to perhaps if more efficient uh, oxygenation with the use of an opioid, it may not it may not only provide comfort for breathlessness, but it may actually add um, hours or days to their life. Now that's not necessarily the goal, right? We wouldn't necessarily be using the opioid to increase survival, um, but I have no concerns that appropriate dosing um, of pain or breathlessness during the dying phase I, has um, will harm the patient in that in any way. One more question for you, Dr. Wong, I think because we're running out of time. What recommendations do you have for people um, whose family or for patients that have pacemakers? Mm -hmm. prior to oh, I love these questions. Um, yeah, so, so again, you, you know, the talk today was actively dying, uh, which is a three day time frame. But so a lot of this work would, you know, ideally start upstream regarding decision making for a pacemaker or an implantable cardio defibrillator. Uh, and, and just so you know, because this is this is something we've been working on in our health system is um, Medicare requires shared decision making before implantation of an ICD pacemaker, for instance. So ideally in health systems um, and for patients and families, there's, there's um, good informed consent along the journey or from implantation to carrying that device um, into, into the death uh, stage. Um, however, you know, what, I, what I would say is that um, typically for a patient who um, is in the active dying stage and, and, if, and, the, and if the goal is to promote and prioritize a comfort focused treatment, we would recommend to um, deactivate a defibrillator um, because a defibrillator is likely to fire um, as your heart goes through some of the changes we described. And so um, it doesn't fire universally during the dying stage, but it is, it is a probable occurrence um, that, the, that the device would, would fire. Um, furthermore, if a patient has made a decision for allowing a natural death or a, a do not resuscitate decision, again, you know, it would be aligned to also deactivate the device. So deactivation typically occurs through the device company 
whoever made the ICD or through your cardiology or EP electrophysiology partners can, can support you with that. Um, and it can be done remotely. Um, I, I, would, I would say that um, all care teams that, that uh, manage patients at end of life should have ready access to a magnet, an ICD magnet. I know um, our hospice agency carries them uh, with them. Um, so that if, if a device could not be deactivated remotely in time uh, before the active dying stage, that you could place a magnet over the device. It's essentially a large uh, kind of kitchen magnet and you can get them from the device manufacturers and it stays on the patient. So you can, you know, usually we would tape it over the device um, and leave it on through death. Um, so we don't take it off. Um, and, and so um, so that can, in the short term, help to deactivate um, an ICD. Now, the question was about a pacemaker. So I would, I would say that the standard of care is not to deactivate a, most pacemakers. Most pacemakers are connected with the defibrillator. The idea that if you, a patient has a tach, tachyarrhythmia that you shock, that the pacemaker would then pick up that bradycardic uh, arrhythmia. Um, if a patient um, has a pacemaker, you'd want to know if they're pacer dependent or not. Many people, the majority of folks with a pacer are not um, pacer dependent. Um, so actually, we just, it, it, you would typically leave it alone and it would just stay in the patient and does not interrupt or interfere with the quality of the death experience for the patient. Now, if a patient is pacemaker dependent um, and you deactivate the pacemaker, that will lead to death. Um, and so that's that's okay. That's an that's an ethical decision, medical decision that could be made with the care team, if a patient felt like the pacemaker was was prolonging life uh, beyond what was medically acceptable. So that's a decision that could be made. Um, but I would just challenge the care team to understand uh, what the device is being used for for the patient, because you'd hate to say, oh, we'll deactivate your pacemaker and you'll just die a normal death over the next few weeks and then they die right away. Um, I think that would be distressing for a family if they didn't share that expectation. So you do want to know if they're dependent on the device or not dependent. Um, if the pacer is part of an ICD, I would leave it alone. If they're pacer dependent, that's a conversation around their goals. Great. With that being the last question, um, I really can't thank you enough for this session. I think, um, you know, as one of your former students, um, I know I learned a lot from this and from, from you, so I can only imagine how helpful and important this was for clinicians and non-clinicians really to understand this really clear phase in um, a person's um, life, the last stages, the last breath. So uh, thank you very much for this. And um, I look forward to seeing you next year at the Life Symposium, uh, Dr. Vicky can have that. And I would like to, like to thank the audience um, for participating in this and asking wonderful questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our CME director, Crystal Salesia. Thank you, Susan. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you both. It. And thank you all for joining us. If you'd like to receive additional information or reference today's webinar or, or reference the slides presented today, please visit us at City of Hope dot org forward slash CME. Be sure to register and invite others to our remaining webinars in this series. Next month, we'll discuss patient perspectives on medical aid in dying.